Would it be possible to build an ocean liner-sized vessel thousands of years ago? Could Noah fit at least two of all the land animals on board the ark? Stay tuned to find the answers. Welcome to Creation Magazine Live. My name is Richard Fangrad. And I'm Calvin Smith. Today on Creation Magazine Live, we're going to talk about Noah's Ark. Right. Uh, it's a popular topic among skeptics as well as Christians. Uh, uh, how could it possibly work, right. this whole story of Noah's Ark? And, uh, and you couldn't build a large wooden boat that big anyway. Right, And right. many of the other arguments there. Yeah, Noah's Ark. I can remember um, before I became a Christian. Um, you know, I, I knew the story of Noah's Ark. It was, I don't know, very, very popular, I guess. And it was this huge wooden boat. It was this floating zoo, and it was supposedly <laughs> carried uh, Noah and, and his uh, sons and their their wives on this this big thing. And you know, I had these questions like, you know, um, how could an ark carry two of every animal? You know, and seven of some I know now, but I didn't know the, the biblical account back then. You know, how, how could it possibly carry two of every kind of animal? You know, there's all these millions of animals and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, did he have to take fish? I can remember wondering that. <laughs> he was supposed to take all the animals. And, you know, why do you have to take those dumb mosquitoes along with them? And, you know, <laughs> questions like right. that that I used to, <laughs> used to ask. But I actually used to use uh, the story of Noah's Ark as a, as a way, of, before I became a Christian, of, of kind of you know, belittling the Bible and say, see, you don't have to trust the Bible because, look, it's got this account in it and how could it be true and so on and so forth. So. Well, the idea of, of the story of, our, of Noah's flood being true or the ark being true has been challenged in many, many different ways, both right. outside and inside the church, right. by non-Christians and by Christians. Uh, just, just wondering about the validity of taking the Bible as straightforward history right. there in Genesis 6 to 9 when it talks about uh, uh, Noah's flood. Yeah. Uh, several New Testament writers refer to it as literal history. Right. Uh, Jesus thought of it as literal history. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so it's it's certainly written as history. The New Testament writers took the story as a real historical event. Right. Jesus comparing the judgment to come with the judgment of right the, 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 at the time of Noah's ark. So, time of Noah's flood. So today we're going to ask all these questions and give you answers. The giraffe's heart is one of the most powerful among animals today. It needs to produce enormous pressure to get blood all the way up its long neck to its brain. This is powerful evidence for a creator because with such high blood pressure only special design features around its brain prevents it from blowing its mind when it bends down to take a drink. This is a problem for evolutionists to explain because without these special features, a giraffe bending over the first time to take a drink would die. But if the neck was shorter in the past, then it wouldn't need the special features. This means that the giraffe must have been designed with all of its features at once, just like the Bible says. For details, see creationontheweb.com forward slash giraffe. Creation Ministries International staff many from a wide variety of scientific disciplines have produced thousands of articles now available in a massive online database www.creationontheweb.org has grown to become the world's most powerful internet resource on the creation evolution issue there are more than five thousand articles already online and new articles are added daily some of the topics covered include the feasibility of Noah's Ark and the evidence for a global flood the age of the earth from both the Bible and science, scientific arguments against the Big Bang and models that explain observations in astronomy within a young earth time frame, recent discoveries that support dinosaurs fitting with biblical history, and many, many more topics. These thousands of articles are available for free 24 hours a day to anyone on earth with an internet connection. One of the main reasons that CMI built this website is to strengthen the faith of Christians. Genesis is one of the most attacked areas of the Bible. Creationontheweb.org 
provides logical, scientifically accurate counterattacks in this area. As 2 Corinthians 10 verse 5 says, we destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God. Got questions? Get answers at creationontheweb.org. Richard Lewinton, an evolutionary biologist at Harvard University, once said, it is not that the methods and institutions of science somehow compel us to accept a material explanation of the phenomenal world, but on the contrary, that we are forced by our a priori adherence to material causes to create an apparatus of investigation and set of concepts that produce material explanations. Moreover, that materialism is absolute, for we cannot allow a divine foot in the door. Here is a clear admission of the censoring of any evidence for creation. To read more than 5,000 articles of censored information, go to www.creationontheweb.org. What does the Bible say about the flood? We, we get quite a description there in Genesis 6 and 7 about what the Bible says about the, uh, about the flood, the ark, uh, Noah, his family, and so on. What actually happened? What actually happened? We can read a number of verses beginning in Genesis 6, verse 14. Mm -hmm. So make yourself an, an ark of cypress wood, make rooms in it, and coat it with pitch inside and out. Mm -hmm. verse, verse 15, this is how you, you are to build the ark. The ark is to be 300 cubits, a breadth of 50 cubits, a height of 30 cubits, so that's uh, roughly 450 feet long, 75 mm -hmm. feet wide, and, and 45 feet high, based on an 18-inch cubit, right. uh, the distance from the tip of your hand to your elbow. Yep. Uh, verse 16, make a roof for it and finish the ark to within 18 inches of the top, put a door in the side of the ark, and make, the, make lower, middle, and upper decks. Okay, so it had one door and three decks. Very specific. Very specific, yeah. Verse 17, I'm going to bring floodwaters on the earth to destroy all life under the heavens, Every creature that has the breath of life in it, everything on earth will perish. Right. Okay, there's, there's a description of the judgment to come. Verse 18, I will establish my covenant with you and you will enter the ark, you and your sons and your, and your wife and your sons' wives with you. And so that's the, the people who were going to be uh, right. uh, saved on the ark. And anyone else that would have, that would have yeah. uh, listened to the message that judgment is coming. This doesn't sound like a parable to me. Well, no, it's, it's, it's very specific. There's, uh, there, there's specific notes there. It's written as, as history mm -hmm. in the Hebrew. Yep. Uh, verse 19, you are to bring into the ark two of all living creatures, male and female, to be kept alive with you. Verse 20, two of every kind of bird, of every kind of animal, and of every kind of creature that moves along the ground will come to you to be kept alive. So birds and land animals. Right. And, and the creatures come to... Right, Noah. right. He wasn't on some kind of a worldwide safari to <laughs> go and find, you know, the, the creatures came, came to him. To, right. That's right. Verse 21, you are to take every kind of food that is to be eaten and store it away as food for you and for them, them right. referring to the animals. 22, that, that rounds out chapter 6, God, uh, Noah did everything just as God commanded him. Mm -hmm. And then if we continue in chapter 7, then the Lord said to Noah, Go into the ark, you and your whole family, because I have found you righteous in this generation. Verse 2, take with you seven of every kind of clean animal, male and, f male and its mate, and two of every kind of unclean animal, male and its mate. Mm -hmm. Verse 3, and also seven of every kind of bird, male and female, to keep their various kinds alive throughout the earth. Right. Uh, verse, if we jump to verse 9, male and female came to Noah, entered... Uh, and, and entered the ark as God had commanded Noah. So here we see this process beginning. Right. Verse 22, if we jump to verse 22 of chapter 7, everything on dry land that had the breath of life in its nostrils died. Mm -hmm. Judgment on sin. Verse 23, every living thing on the face of the whole earth was wiped out, men and animals and the creatures that move along the ground and the birds of the air were wiped from the earth. Only Noah was left and those with him in the ark. And uh, one more from chapter 8, verse 20. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord, and taking some of the clean animals and the clean birds, he sacrificed burnt offerings on it. This is, of course, after the flood. Uh, God, Noah thanks God for sparing him. Right. So I hope everyone listening, when you're reading those, because all these points that you, you read are specific things we're going to be talking about today. Because I, I, I think people, sometimes they miss the details 
and the detail that God has, has put in his word that can give us some clues because we weren't there. We only have this account. We right. only have the amount of information that was there. But of course, skeptics love to talk about this. So, uh, you know, one of the first things you mentioned is how big was, was the ark? We actually get some dimensions in there. Sure. Now, yeah. the, you, you mentioned a cubit. That was a, a measurement, a, a way of measuring things. And it was typically from the tip of your finger to, to your elbow. That was, that was a cubit. Right. And that was about 18 inches long. Now, there's been talk lately that because there's different cubits. There was, there was well, different, yeah. different your, your cubit is different than my cubit. Well, but, but there's even like different uh, styles of cu cubits. Oh, there's see, like yes. royal cubits, and, and, and so there's actually different. But we're talking about the shortest cubit was 18 inches. So everything I'm going to be discussing today uh, is going to be based on an 18-inch cubit. So it's the minimum. It could be larger than, than what we're mentioning here. But you mentioned that the, uh, if, if you translate cubits into 18 inches and then and go by the dimensions, the arc was 450 feet long. 75 feet wide and 45 feet high. That is a huge boat. The actual volume on board is 1.52 million cubic feet, which is a, a staggering amount of space. So to put this in perspective, this is the equivalent volume of 522 standard railway cars. Now, if you've ever been sitting there at the red light watching the, the, the train go by, and here's a, here's a PowerPoint to maybe to help you, you can see some railway cars there, start counting. Like one, two, if we direct into 522, that's a massive amount of room. That's a lot of space. That was available on the arc if you, if you go by the, the dimensions. Now, the next thing you get into is, well, what about the, the seaworthiness of it? Like, could you actually have a, a wooden boat that big? And what about the shape of it? And would it be seaworthy and stuff like that? Um, so, you know, I'm going to show you some common arc shapes we get. Here's the, uh, here's the classic. The bathtub arc. <laughs> right, on, on the church nursery wall. Right. And uh, we obviously laugh because, you know, we know it's cute and it's meant for the nursery and stuff like that, but the problem is nobody's going to think of that as a real boat. Right. When you walk into a church nursery and, and even if visitors come in, they leave their kids there and, and go to the church service. It, it's a myth. It it's just a... screams, this is a fairy tale. This kids right. can't possibly be true because exactly. a, a boat shaped like that, can, can, it wouldn't work. That's right. So here's another uh, picture. Um, you know, this is commonly uh, uh, drawn. You know, it looks just kind of like a big boat, um, but still got that you know that regular yeah, boat shape, and it's got an open top, and you know, doesn't really look like it. So this was the um, the shape that we commonly referred to up to to a short time ago. It was a, more like a barge because we know the ark it didn't need sails. It didn't need a way to move maneuver right. around because it was the earth's covered in water. It doesn't need to to you know steer. Uh, and, and so forth. Yeah, a so big I'm, rectangular box. Right, is, is just a, just a cargo cargo yeah. vessel, basically. But um, here's a more recent look of what we we feel the ark, you know, may have looked like. You'll notice that uh, that wind vane on the front, because uh, when when skeptics ask about, well, could it have survived these waves? You know, we've done tests, and of course, if you have a lot of a lot of high waves and stuff, puts a lot of stress on on ships, and so uh, the. You know, many researchers now feel that if you'd had this big wind vane, the wind would have pushed the the arc, so it would have faced the you know the waves oncoming, and it wouldn't have um, you know got pounded, uh, right. pounded to pieces. I mean, some research research has been done recently to suggest that that large, the rectangle uh, shaped arc would line itself up with the waves, right, uh, quite quickly, and and so you'd have this massive mm. rocking that's right uh, on the arc. That's right. So um, and. and to follow up with that, there, there's been some interesting studies done. As a matter of fact, um, in 1992, a creationist group in Korea approached a world-class ship uh, research center, it was CRISO, which is the Korea Research Institute of Ships and Ocean Engineering in uh, Daejeon, Korea. And they analyzed the biblical ark. So what they did is they took the dimensions of the ark uh, that are listed in the Bible and, and you know, played with different shapes and, and, and volumes and stuff like that. And, and so they came up with some interesting um, uh, points there. And by the way, for anybody interested in more information on the validity of Noah's Ark and, and you're looking for some more information, you can visit our website, creationontheweb.org, but also this one here, www.worldwideflood.com. We link to this website from our website because it has such great information. Great. But uh, here's some pictures from the, uh, the study that was done um, by Creso. And basically what they, what they determined that Noah's Ark was extremely stable um, to violent seas. And, and the fact that the dimensions that the Ark is listed at 
w would have been able to withstand a lot of tipping and you know before it would have overturned it, capsized, it was yeah. a very yeah. very stable um, you know style of boat um, criticisms like well a wooden ship you know wouldn't have been able to survive the stresses it's interesting that when you go back in history um, ancient Greeks were using te uh, techniques like mortise and tenon planking in the fourth century BC and uh, we take a look at the the diagram here what it is is it's a plank and it's got slats cut in it so these pegs would go inside and then you would use uh, a, like a dowel to put these things together and what they found out is it's provided tremendous strength with transverse shear uh, longitudinal shear you could build tremendously strong boats out of wood out of wood and and this is in the fourth century BC we're not talking modern technology and and, and things like that and uh, we can see a uh, here's a picture from a, a plank of a wrecked ship that used this style of, uh, of technology so really when you look back in history there's ample evidence that this type of technology for shipbuilding could create a very um, stable um, seaworthy um, and, and uh, you know it, that it's a viable concept that the people who put the art together knew what they were doing If God didn't create the sun until day four, how could each of the previous three days have been real days? Although we are not told what the light source was, the Bible says that God created the earth and light on the first day. Thus, we can deduce that on the first three days, the earth was already rotating in space relative to God's created light, enabling a day-night cycle. In the book of Revelation, we read that in the future new heavens and earth there will once again be no need for sun. Creation Ministries International staff, many from a wide variety of scientific disciplines, have produced thousands of articles now available in a massive online database. www.creationontheweb.org has grown to become the world's most powerful internet resource on the creation evolution issue. There are more than 5,000 articles already online and new articles are added daily. Some of the topics covered include the feasibility of Noah's Ark and the evidence for a global flood, the age of the earth from both the Bible and science, scientific arguments against the Big Bang and models that explain observations in astronomy within a young earth time frame recent discoveries that support dinosaurs fitting with biblical history, and many, many more topics. These thousands of articles are available for free 24 hours a day to anyone on earth with an internet connection. One of the main reasons that CMI built this website is to strengthen the faith of Christians. Genesis is one of the most attacked areas of the Bible. Creationontheweb.org provides logical, scientifically accurate counterattacks in this area. As 2 Corinthians 10 verse 5 says, we destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God. Got questions? Get answers at creationontheweb.org. So we're talking about Noah's Ark and uh, we've seen some evidence that uh, you know, you actually could build a, a large wooden ship like this, that the dimensions of the ark uh, make sense, that there it would create a, a seaworthy um, craft and so on and so forth. And it would survive the forces of the flood. That's right. And, uh, you know, I, I showed some of that mortise and tenon planking, you know, a, a kind of an interesting construct for wood and stuff like that. But, um, you know, with, with the way we put things together these days, we, we've kind of forgotten that, you know, these, these people from centuries back and, and thousands of years ago, they weren't primitive. As a matter of fact, right. here's an interesting picture here. This is the uh, Church of the Transfiguration, built in 1714. This was built uh, during the reign of Peter the Great, and it has 22 soaring onion domes. You can see them in the picture, you know, those, those unique uh, shape, they call right. them onion domes, yep. and it's uh, sheathed in hundreds of aspen shingles. The interesting thing about this entire church was no nails were used in its construction. No, ma no nails anywhere in the construction of it. Now, um, I know a little bit about construction, and that <laughs> is absolutely mind-blowing when you, when you think of that. To, to put you know, a, a, a bureau, a, a chest of drawers together, 
and not have any nails or, or things like that, or glue. It takes skill. It takes a lot of skill. And so here's an entire church. So I think a lot of people have that idea, well, you know, Noah was primitive and, you know, he didn't really have the technology and stuff like that. But um, obviously he would have been very intelligent and uh, who knows what kind of uh, technology and, and skill was available to right. him at the time. Now, uh, the idea of, you know, these, this large wooden ship, some people think, well, there, there's been no record of anything near Noah's Ark, but it's not true. For comparison, right? For comparison, yes. you know, wooden vessels. Here's a, a neat, uh, a neat uh, article from Time Asia. So this is Time Magazine, but the Time Asia from okay. Asia. And there's the online reference there. Um, and the article talked about a 15th century Chinese admiral, Zhang He. Zhang He had hundreds of ships in his treasure fleet, it says, but the largest, 130 meters long, 60 meters wide, and it was uh, a nine-masted galleon. It says they were technological masterpieces, watertight bulkheads which stored drinking water and supplies kept the ship afloat if the hull was breached. It said Zhang He's fleet traveled from China all the way to Kenya, Africa, and back. So here's, here's uh, a secular source talking about these huge ships that the, the Chinese had built. And uh, this will give you a little bit of a, an idea. You see the, uh, you know, the Pinta, the Nina, and the Santa Maria, right, uh, yeah. Columbus sailing to, uh, to the New World. There's an actual picture of the Santa Maria in scale to, uh, to one of the, uh, the, the, the Chinese galleons. Wow. And this was actually, uh, the, the, in the picture, this would have been smaller than the one referred to in the... Um, in the article, but you'll notice even this one is 440 feet long. Um, yeah, about the size of the ark. About the size of the ark. So the and concept made out of wood, made out of not, wood, not metal, obviously. And it and it wasn't just you know hugging the shore all the time. It made long voyages and right. so on and so forth. So very believable what we see um, uh, written. In so what about the, the animals? How many animals would Noah have had to take with him on board the ark? That's a that's a question that skeptics ask. Right, because you okay, you couldn't have fit the animals on board. Well, first of all, you have to find out how big it is. Now you find out how many you need to put on, right? Right. All right. Well, I guess the relevant passages would be, um, and you shall bring into the ark two of every kind of every living thing of all flesh to keep them alive with you. It shall be made male and female. Two of every kind shall come to you and keep them alive of birds after their kind and of beasts after their kind and every creeping thing on the earth after its kind. And then we're told we need seven of the air, uh, birds of the air, and seven of the clean animals. So now we know what we're, what we're talking about here. Okay, so that was from Genesis 6, 19 and 20. That's right. And Genesis 7, verses 2 and 3. Exactly. So the first thing we need to, to go over is what is a kind. And I know we've talked about this before, but I thought I'd do this really quickly on this, uh, this episode. Um, obviously, we're talking about dogs. This is your dog, This right? is my dog. <laughs> if you walk through my front door, that's what you see. Uh, his name's Caleb. And uh, he's about 180 pounds. <laughs> so he's my kind of like my security dog. And not the cat. That's just a snack. I'm just joking. Uh, <laughs> no, no, no. We, we, we letters over that one. I know, no. We, there's been no cats destroyed in the making of the show. Uh, <laughs> just joking. Uh, of course, my, my son, I have three children, and uh, he wanted a dog, too. That was my, my oldest daughter's, and so my son, he wanted a dog. And uh, so we have this other dog, a medium-sized one named Abby. And then my little youngest daughter, she wanted a little foo-foo dog, you know, one of those little, little <laughs> cute and cuddly things. But <laughs> why am I showing you this? Well, the point of it is this. All three of those things are the same kind of animal. Right. They're all dogs. And so Noah... So Noah would have taken two of the dog kind. Right. right. Not all the, the poodles and all the, the, the specialty animals and horses. So just two of the horse kind, two of the dog kind, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So once you know um, of the kinds then um, we need to know, okay, Hebrew words beast or cattle in the passages that we're, we're talking about, behemoth, refers to land vertebrate animals in general. See, when it talks about um, the creatures that uh, had the breath of life in their nostrils, you know, things like insects and stuff, that's, that's not what's referred to here. Right. And fish, you know, he didn't have to have aquariums on the ark and, and things like that. There's a land vertebrate animals that needed to right. be on. Land-dwelling, air-breathing animals, right. more or less. Right. Now, it says seven of the clean animals, but clean animals, there's not many of them in comparison to the what would be considered the unclean, unclean. animals. Right. If you look in Leviticus and you compare Scripture to Scripture, so there's not many of the animals that you need to take seven of. And the uh, birds of the air that you needed to take seven of, well, a lot of them were small because some birds, we don't know if they were created that way, but some birds don't uh, fly in the air. So uh, we know what he didn't take. We know what he did take. So 
animals in total. There's a great resource that Creation Ministries carries, and it's called uh, Noah's Ark, a feasibility study, put together by uh, John uh, Woodmurphy, and uh, he answers pretty well every question you could ever think. He answers it's questions a, I never thought of. It's a it's a huge resource on this whole <laughs> area of yep. Noah's flood. It, it's called a feasibility study. Right. What he's what he's looked at is all of the arguments from skeptics. Right. The, all the arguments that skeptics have thrown at the story of Noah's Ark over the uh, over the years. That's right. Uh, and and he's just refuted those uh, point by point. He yep. looks at everything: heating, light, lighting, ventilation. That's right. Uh, uh, of course, the space requirements. We'll, t we'll talk a little bit about that now. So we know the kinds of animals that he needed. Keeping in context of kinds, okay, we know what he didn't take. We know that created kinds were not, not as diversified as they are now. Uh, Wood Murapi says that there's about 8,000 animal kinds that you would have needed to take on the ark. And he's including... Um, extinct kinds that we see today. Okay, so then about 16,000 individual animals. Right. And that's, right. that's he says, is an upper limit. He's, he's giving the skeptics lots mm. of breathing room there. It was right. likely much less than that. Right, but it's ex including creatures like dinosaurs. We're going to talk about that a little okay. later on the show right. and things like that because that always comes up. Yeah. yeah. So um, he, he, he says, if the animals were kept in cages with an average size, and some would be much bigger, others smaller, of 20 by 20 by 12 inches, that's 4,800 cubic inches, 16,000 animals would only occupy about 42,000 cubic feet, or 14.4 stock cars. Remember we said it would be 522 railway cars? Okay. He said it, that you know, if they were just packaged like that, it would be not even 15 railway cars. We've got lots of room for, for the animals wow. on the ark. Then, uh, uh, of course, left over, you've got to have room for food. He was commanded, Noah was commanded to take food on board and water and, and things like that. And swimming pool and badminton courts and, and <laughs> yeah. all kinds of room. Yeah. So he says all the animals together, um, you know, if, if you separated them all, you'd need less than half the available floor space on the Ark's three decks. So, uh, um, you know, and, and of course, then you think, okay, well, you could put the cages down. You could stack food on top of the cages. That would make sense for some of the animals because you'd, you know, you'd have the, the food and water stored in that right. area. And, yes, and so he suggests and so all kinds of things, doesn't he, about how eight people could have managed that, that, that many animals. Right. Have food on the top deck. Anim animals are on the middle deck. You shovel it down through holes in the floor. Uh, all kinds of farming techniques that have been used for centuries. Uh, for, for how farmers take care of uh, huge herds of cows or chickens or pigs right. or, or, or that kind of thing. Yeah. So, you know, most people are really surprised by information like this. Most people have just written it off. Ah, oh, there's no way he could do that. He couldn't get all the animals in there. When you sit down with a calculator and you actually go through you do it. Do the math. Yeah, because so many people will just make a bold statement. Oh, there's no way he could have fit that many animals on the earth. Well, how many animals do you need to take? Well, I don't know, but you, you, you just couldn't do it. Yeah, it has to be a fairy tale. Yeah, but they've never actually sit down. And so it amazes people when, when you show them this kind of information. Like, really? You really could take that many animals on the ark? And, and of course, eight people looking after them? There, there is a lot of logistical challenges here to having a big floating zoo. I guess the point is it's not impossible. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. So um, we're going to be uh, talking upcoming. We're going to have our uh, In the News segment, see if uh, Noah's Ark is still newsworthy. And uh, we're going to uh, uh, go over some more questions that skeptics have posed about Noah's Ark. Right. Many Christians are convinced that scientists have proven that the universe is billions of years old. In Genesis 1, we learn that God created the heavens, the earth, and all they contain in six days. It's plain to see that the word day in Genesis 1 clearly means a literal 24-hour day. The Hebrew word for day is used more than 2,300 times throughout the Old Testament, but its meaning is only questioned in Genesis. Why? Because the idea of millions of years is so ingrained in our society today. Each issue of Creation Magazine contains articles by scientists refuting the millions of years and supporting a recent creation in six real days, just like the Bible says. Noah's Ark, a feasibility study. The Bible plainly teaches that the flood of Noah's day covered the entire globe. But this raises serious questions. How could Noah and his family have cared for all of the animals? What did the carnivorous animals eat during and after the flood? 
The account of Noah's flood is perhaps the most attacked account in the Bible. Skeptics and Christians alike have raised some serious and seemingly unanswerable questions regarding this event. Were dinosaurs on board? How do you get rid of that much animal waste? Did Noah have to go all over the world trapping the animals he brought on board? Did Noah's family carry all of the diseases we experience today? In this excellent and in-depth book, author John Woodmerapi presents satisfying answers to these and many more questions you probably never knew existed. A delight for the serious thinker. So in the news, we're in the, in the news section. We try to do this uh, every week. What's going on and in the news? Exactly. Well, uh, I thought this was interesting and appropriate for, uh, for today's show. Came across this as an article 2006, actually. And it says that Norway building a remote Arctic seed vault in case of global catastrophe. Oh. And so this is pretty interesting. It uh, went on to say it sounds like something from a science fiction film. A doomsday vault carved into a frozen mountainside on a secluded Arctic island, ready to serve as Noah's Ark for seeds in case of a global catastrophe. So see, they're, they're automatically linking it to the account of Noah's Ark in the Bible. Saving seeds, yeah, okay. I mean, people, people know the, the, the account. And it said, that basically they've got this, this place and, and they've got all these domestic seeds on there because they're thinking, well, if we get wiped out by some kind of global catastrophe, we'll need to you know, have these things so we can plant crops oh, okay. and stuff like that. Okay. Yep. It says it's designed to house as many as three million of the world's crop seeds. Okay. And uh, it, it, this is an interesting uh, comment. It said Norway's agricultural minister, uh, Johansson, has called the vault a Noah's Ark on Svalbard. That's what he, he says. Its purpose is to ensure <laughs> the survival of crop diversity in the event of plant epidem epidemics, nuclear war, natural disasters, or climate change, and to offer the world a chance to restart growth of food crops that may have been wiped out. Now, I mean, obviously the link to what we're talking about here is, is direct, but see, the concept of what Noah's Ark was to do, it, it, it makes total sense. Right. Preserve living things to, to, to restart after uh, after wiping things out right, right. in case yeah. of a, a of a global catastrophe so you know many times people say oh there's never such thing as noah's flood and oh you talk about this worldwide global catastrophe well why would you even go there why would you even talk about something that could you know wipe out everything on the earth and that we're going to have to restart it it's not a far-fetched idea this article completely validates the whole concept it's just the fact that people, you know, obviously if you believe in Noah's flood, you believe in Noah's ark, then you believe in the validity of the Bible, so on and so forth. But, but these aren't fanciful fairy tale ideas, it, 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 even conceptually. Right. That, yeah. the, that the earth could possibly be uh, devastated and that we'll need to restart at some point. So I, I just found it to. Uh, right. I mean, they're not talking about a flood, but some other, an asteroid hits the Earth or something. That's right. Or a um, catastrophic event. Which, actually, what are they talking about in terms of what? Are they proposing anything there in the well, article? Well, yeah. As to they, what they might said, be the mechanism that destroys the Earth? Well, here? they did mention plant epidemics, nuclear war, natural ah. disasters, which I think a worldwide flood would be a natural disaster, and it said, or climate change. Um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah, they're proposing many different things, but they're all catastrophic. Okay. Now, we've been told many, many times, well, no, no, you don't explain geology through catastrophism, right? So, anyway. Right. So we've got another one here from ABC News. This is uh, ABC in, uh, in the U.S., not in uh, Australia. Um, ABC, Australian Broadcasting Company, right, same, right. same type of thing. But over here, we're more familiar with ABC News in the U.S. Right. Has Noah's Ark been found? This, <sighs> is, the, uh, this, is, this is the title of the article. <coughs> Uh, Christian archaeological team believes it has found the ark. This is the subtitle. Right. I'll just read some of this. This is from June 29, 2006, so last year. A team of Texas archaeologists believe they may have located the remains of Noah's ark in Iran's Elbers mountain range. Elbers, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. <laughs> I can't imagine what it could be if it's not the ark, said Arch Bonema, Bonema I hope I'm pronouncing that right, of the Bible Archaeological Search and Exploration, or BASE Institute, the BASE Institute, a Christian archaeological organization dedicated to looking for biblical artifacts. Uh, the article says, um, we, got, we got up to this object nestled in the side of a hill, a, a member of BASE, uh, the BASE Institute said, we found something that has my heart skipping a beat. 
So they're, they're, they're excited about this. At first, they didn't dare hope it was the biblical boat. Uh, uh, one of the folks says, it wasn't impressive at first. I certainly didn't think it was Noah's Ark, but when we got close, we were amazed it looked similar to wood. Right. And they go on later in the article, it's provocative to think that this could be the lost Ark of Noah. Throughout history, people have been searching for the Ark to help prove God's existence. <laughs> really? <laughs> Okay, uh, there's an idea, he goes on to say, there's an idea that if we can prove the ark existed, then we can prove that the story existed, and more importantly, we can prove that God existed. Wow. And this is uh, Bruce Filer, the author of Where God Was Born. And so I, I, just, I just find that interesting, that right. uh, here they're saying, well, if we can just find the ark, this, this Christian archaeological team, the, the base institute, right. if we can just find the ark, will prove that the story of Noah and the flood is, is true. Right. But I just, I'm just thinking right now of, of, of back to what uh, uh, the, the, the story that we read about in the New Testament where Abraham died, Lazarus died, and so on, and, mm -hmm. and uh, they're, they're looking for this evidence. Uh, uh, Lazarus is, or, or uh, uh, the, the, the rich man and the mm -hmm. poor man, rather. right? Right, right. Uh, and and uh, the, the rich man who, who's in hell is saying, oh, send someone from the dead to warn my brothers who are right. still living, because if someone rises from the dead, surely they'll believe, and they'll change their ways, they'll repent, they'll believe that, right. uh, that there, there's a heaven and a hell. Yeah. And the response is, they have Moses and the prophets. Right. Let them read Moses and the prophets. Mm -hmm. That's, they have the scripture. Even if someone rises from the dead, they're not going to believe. Right. And, and I just think of you know, this, this notion of if we could, it's, it's a magic bullet, right? right? If we can just come up with this one magic bullet evidence, we can, we can have mass conversions all over the globe. If the Ark of Noah would be found, and many creationists, even, even uh, folks on our staff, believe that it wouldn't have been found, it would have been torn apart and used as lumber right. uh, in, in after the flood. Yeah. But uh, if, if it's still intact and if it were to be found, what would the skeptics say? I mean, you, you could put that on a truck. Well, it wouldn't fit on a truck, but you, you could drag that down every main street in, in every town around the world. What are the skeptics going to say? They're going to say, it's not Noah's Ark. That's right. It, or you know, or it's, it's the Ark that gave rise to the myth about Noah's Ark in the Bible, but it still doesn't prove the Bible right. is true, and, and, and et cetera, et cetera, right. et cetera. I mean, et cetera. It, it would be great for us to be able to find that. As creationists, as Christians. We'd be excited, yeah. Oh, we'd be excited. Would it lead to mass conversions? So, some Christian groups feel that it would. Right. Would it lead to mass conversions? I don't think so. Probably not. It would probably get people thinking and talking and stuff like that, it's, which is exactly what we do, really, when we're out, out speaking. Now, we're talking mainly to church groups, and we're there to show them that, you know, that the, the feasibility of, of these accounts in uh, the Bible, that they are, you know, you can read them as plainly written, because God's Word says it's true, it's true. And, and so people want to know, well, what about the logistics and stuff like right, that? Right, right. What about the details? And, right. and so we've got those scientists on staff. We, they're, they're doing research, reinterpreting things that are out there. Yeah. And, and we publish that in Creation Magazine. And that's, that's what we're trying to do on this show. Exactly. To reveal a bit of the, the, the information that's published in Creation Magazine on our website, in the books, and so on. And to get this out in a little bit of a different format so that you folks can download it to your iPods and, <laughs> and, uh, and, and watch it on your computers. That's what this ministry is all about. Exactly the evidence that supports the biblical history. Normally, when an animal dies, it decays quickly. The skin decays and the bones fall apart or disarticulate. Finding fossilized soft tissue, such as skin, implies very rapid burial before it decayed. Describing a duck-billed dinosaur unearthed in South Dakota, one researcher said, you can see the individual scales. Because of the presence of skin and the complete articulation of the animal, it was obviously not killed and it was obviously not scavenged. A worldwide flood would rapidly bury animals and rapidly buried animals, not buried slowly, are exactly what we see in the fossil record. The Genesis Flood. This short 32-page booklet will answer your questions about the reality of Noah's Flood and the Ark. How big was the Ark? Could such a huge wooden vessel be seaworthy? How many animals went on board? How could kangaroos get from Australia to the Ark? Has anyone ever seen Noah's Ark? Was the Flood global? Where did the water come from? Where did it go? Is there evidence of the Flood? 
Author Dr. Taz Walker, an engineer and geologist, answers the most commonly asked questions and shows that the biblical account is thoroughly believable. He also explains where you can see the evidence. This is suitable for ages from high school to adult. Well, we're back and we're talking about Noah's Ark. And uh, right. we want to just give some of, the, um, some of the examples that sometimes skeptics have, have brought up to try to discredit you know, the idea of Noah's Ark. For example, one of them is, you know, what about all the diseases we see today? The, so the, the, right. I guess the, the argument would be, you know, Noah and his family would have had to have been disease-ridden, you know, uh, you know, they would have had to have every disease in the, in the book. They would have come off the ark and then, you know, in order for us to have it. But it doesn't really make sense. What, what people don't really realize is things like the plague and AIDS and things like that, they probably didn't exist at the time that they came off the ark because we're living in a fallen world. Um, when we study, you know, genetics, we see mutations. Things are getting worse, not better. We're devolving, not evolving. Right. For example, here's a, an example of the bubonic plague. Killed about a quarter of the Earth, uh, popula or Europe's population in the 1300s. Researchers hypothesized that the loss of DNA due to mutations um, in, in certain bacteria related to the disease um, is actually what caused it to degenerate to the point where it was actually harmful to people. They, it, they figured it lost about 149 genes due to frame shift mutations, deletions, or other mutations. So that's a loss of information. It's a corruption of DNA that caused this disease to come into being. And so that's what caused the plague? That's what they, they, they figured, that the certain bacteria basically uh, degenerated to a point where it was very harmful. Oh, okay. So it didn't exist before then. Um, how about behavioral things? For example, Kuru, that's a disease that's pretty nasty. You, you go insane, basically, um, and, and you get that from being a cannibal. <laughs> eating someone else's brain. So obviously the, the disease is, is, is part of that, but I mean, that's a behavioral thing. Um, that's something that shouldn't have existed in God's perfect world. Um, so here we see examples where those types of things probably never even existed at the time of, of Noah's right. flood. They, so they've developed since that time. Noah's family, they didn't have to carry those things with them in their bodies uh, uh, through the, the event of the flood. Exactly, exactly. Um, we mentioned uh, dinosaurs before. You know, dinosaurs. We, that's you had, a, apparently a big problem. Right. Huge animals, you know, 40 feet tall and so on, many tons. Yeah, 80 ton Ultrasaurus. How would you get that on board the ark, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Um, well, two things. Uh, here, here's a, a PowerPoint that will uh, help you figure out one thing. Um, remember we talked about kinds. I showed you some, some of the dogs are in my house, different kinds. Um, basically, creationists figure there's only about 50 dinosaur kinds. You know, you see a little chihuahua, you see a, a, a big Great Dane, well, you see, you know, the smaller Velociraptor, you see a, a, a T-Rex, basic same body shape, body type and stuff. So we feel that there was there were more variation within a kind. So number one, you, you've only got about 50 dinosaur kinds. Right. And the other thing is, is if you were going to repopulate the earth after the flood, you probably wouldn't take grandma and grandpa on Bored, right? Yeah, they they got to you know replenish right, uh, right. and stuff. Take the young ones, the small ones. They get off the ark after the flood. They repopulate the species. Right. You want young people for that kind of activity, <laughs> not senior citizens. Right. But that, uh, and, and interesting that some of the, the the creatures that we see today, for example, uh, sharks. You know, um, the average shark, uh, great white shark today, you know, would probably have a, a tooth that size. You know, that's a big shark. But this shark here probably would have been about 80 feet long. And sharks do wow. something interesting. They grow until they die. Well, so do crocodiles and, and things like that. So if you can picture these things growing and growing and growing and growing, you see the, the lifespans, of course, before the, the flood of, of people were very great. If creatures' lifespans were very great, some of these huge dinosaurs may have been around for many, many years. So a young one could have been very small in comparison to some of the fossil record we see. Right. Um, it, funny, funny objections we get sometimes. What, what would you do with all the waste products generated by 16,000? Well, why did you pick this one to talk about on this show? I mean, of well, I all just, of the things we could have talked about, I, excretory I, requirements, it says in my notes here. Well, I just all thought right, it was... Well, what's, what's the deal with that? Well, well, think about it. You know what? It's actually a good argument. What would you do with the waste product from 16,000 animals? I mean, if we brought well, a couple of horses into the right, studio yeah, right now... It's a now, legitimate problem, I guess, right? right? What would you do with the waste? You've got, so. you know, you've got methane, you've got all sorts of problems, right? Right. Bad smell. <laughs> Bad smells. Um, well, for example, here's, uh, you know, how do they, they dispose of the waste? Well, the amount of labor could be minimized in a lot of different ways. Um, they could have had sloped floors or slatted cages, so, you know, then the droppings go down, they, they 
put them down. They would have gone into a composting uh, manure bed, um, or they could have been flushed away. There would have been a lot of water around if they, you know, slanted them off and, and, and dumped them outside the yard. Um, things like absorbent material, sawdust, uh, shavings, peat moss um, can absorb a lot of moisture and, and, and smell and stuff like that. And, and a lot of times you don't have to change it for a very long time. The other thing is, you get a big boat, especially towards the bottom, many animals would have hibernated in that type of condition. Right? right many animals yeah. today hibernate. It's dark, the limited mobility. Right. And, and so uh, the, the chance of how, how much you had to feed them, for example, would have been lessened. And then, of course, the problem we've, <laughs> we've brought right. up, you'd have less... Less well, problem on the other end. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's the way you could put it. So speaking of the other end, what about the food requirements? I mean... Okay, you, you, right, you, yes. You know, you, you got a, you got a, ton of, uh, a ton of these animals, you've got to feed them. Well, we already mentioned hibernation. Maybe you didn't need that many. But it is pointed out to Noah that he needs to bring food on board um, right, the Right, that was specific there in Genesis. Right. Um, so the ark, you know, they probably could have carried uh, compressed or dried food stuffs. You wouldn't need, you know, fresh veggies and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, so it could have had a lot of grains, hay, fiber. Um, and Wooden Rappy, in, in his book, Feasibility Study, says that probably it was about 15% of the ark's volume would have been taken up um, trying to feed the animals, you know, with, with, with stuff like that. And drinking water would have taken up about less of 10% because... It could have been less because if you if, if they'd constructed you know troughs on the top of the ark and, and let rainwater uh, come in, they perhaps could have uh, limited the amount of water they needed like okay, that too. Rainwater, yeah, if they had a way of filtering it. So again, when when you actually look into the logistics of it, and and um, Wood Murphy went to many people um, that that you know cage large large numbers of animals today. And how do you feed them all? And how do you do this? And how do you make it economical? And he's got some real-world explanations of how this could could have been done, right. uh, you know, quite so, easily. So again, we see that the bottom line, all these these arguments that skeptics have thrown at the story of Noah and the flood, when you go and do the research and do your homework, there are solutions that present themselves right. to, to, to many of these problems. It doesn't mean that that it would have been easy for Noah and his family, but right. it also suggests that it is not impossible. The, the, the story of Noah's flood, because of all these arguments from skeptics, it is not made impossible by those arguments. All of those arguments can be answered. Right. With uh, uh, there are answers to those things. And, and think of all the things that have happened since the God created the world, uh, around six thousand years ago. I mean, this is one of the accounts that's in the Bible. It's in there for a reason. It's a special account. I mean, this is a very special event that happened. Of course, it's recorded, and, and of course, it's unusual. Um, and, and Noah certainly took a long time to build the ark, and he would have had a long time to think about all these problems and, yes. and all those. Well, what about the ventilation? And, and we're given a certain amount of information that God gave Noah. We don't know if there was any more that you know God had given and stuff like that. For example, um, one of the arguments that's been used against uh, the story is, you know, the Bible says to coat the ark in pitch, right? To, to keep it. Uh, Waterproof. Watertight, okay. Right, right. So uh, one of the arguments I heard one time was, okay, well, pitch, what is that? It's tar. And, of course, we believe that, uh, you know, um, tar would have been formed at the time of Noah's flood. It would have been a byproduct of, of, of you know, um, burying plant materials and all that kind of stuff. So if you needed the flood to get the tar, but you needed the tar to coat the boat, Okay, you've okay, got a, you, yeah. you got a problem here now. argument against the story of Noah's, right? Noah's Ark. Yeah. But it's interesting, um, the Encyclopedia Britannica, says about naval pitch, which is a pitch used to coat boats. And it said, uh, oleoresin, also called gum or pitch, is extracted from the pine. So you can take pine trees and you can burn them and you can extract the sap out of them and you get a thing called pitch. Oh, and, you, okay. and you mix it with, uh, I, I guess, the, the ashes and stuff like that and you get this tarry, pitchy material so, and that's, that's particularly talking about naval pitch. So again, it's not that, oh, this is an unsolvable problem. It's that many times the answers come from things like, like I mentioned before. Look at the carpentry that we used to do or used to be able to do. Right, ancient ships, ancient uh, wooden ships. Right. right. You're probably not going to make Noah's Ark at a press board. <laughs> you know what I mean? But no. we're, we're used to seeing things done in a certain way today, and, and this isn't um, unusual. Another, another objection, where would he get the koalas from? Where would he get the kangaroos from? Did he have to travel to Australia and things right. like that? See, again, yes. they're not picturing the world before 
the flood. So it was one landmass before that right. broke up during the flood. And also, again, as we, uh, we pointed out in the scripture, God sent the animals to Noah. He didn't need to go around and pick up the kiwis here and do this here right. and, and yeah. all that kind of stuff. He simply had the animals sent to him. And then he did have the logistical problems of, of looking after them for, for a year. But, uh, but you can believe it. It's a believable account. That's right. In Genesis chapter 2, the order of creation seems to be different to that in chapter 1, with the plants being created after Adam. Does the Bible contradict itself here? A close look at the original language reveals that the plants mentioned in chapter 2 verse 5 refers to cultivated plants only, not all plants. The point being made is that in the world before the curse, before the appearance of thorns and thistles, no one was needed to cultivate plants. Another thing to keep in mind is that Genesis 2 is not a chronological account like chapter 1. It focuses mostly on the details of day 6. When the Bible appears to contradict itself, careful study always reveals that the Bible is free of contradiction. It really is the Word of God. Finding answers to questions about the origins debate. Creation or evolution? When the results are in, which one is supported by scientific observations? Find out at creationontheweb.org. Creation scientists and researchers from around the world have contributed more than 5,000 articles, many of which appeared in leading creation's publications like Creation Magazine and the Journal of Creation over more than 30 years. A new daily front page article keeps web visitors informed about the latest breaking news in the creation evolution debate. When news breaks about the latest evolutionary ape man, or some major supposed evidence for evolution, check out creationontheweb.org for a Christian creationist response. Each weekend the website features a feedback article, a response to web visitors email feedback. Often the anti-creationist arguments in skeptics emails are refuted in a detailed response by a CMI staff member. So in a very practical way believers can see that the Bible and particularly Genesis can be defended against skeptics arguments. The website includes an online store where you can browse through hundreds of the world's leading creationist books, DVDs and related materials, all available to build up the faith of the believer. Got questions? Get answers at creationontheweb.org. section of the show. This is a fun fun section where people um, can email in uh, questions about uh, topics that we that's cover. Right. Real and, people uh, send real emails. That's right. And we really read them. <laughs> <laughs> and we try to get to as many as we can. Uh, here's a great one um, from the United States. Uh, it's titled Helpful in Dispelling Doubt. And it says, uh, Dear uh, Creation Ministries, I wanted to quickly write and thank you for what you're doing and what you're providing. I'm amazed by the spectrum of topics covered and encouraged by the scientific acad academic merit within each article. I've definitely taken advantage of your resources. It says, I can't think of a single relevant question that isn't some way addressed on your website, which is true. <laughs> it's very extensive, over 5,000 articles, I believe, now on our, on our right. website. I also appreciate your bookstore, which I accessed today for the first time. Um, of course, people can access our bookstore and, and resource center via the web. something like 400 titles creation books and DVDs uh, available online. That's right. Yeah. Uh, creationist books are hard to find, he says. Not only do you offer them, but they're authored by people with significant and current knowledge in the areas they address. It's very true. We have PhD scientists that address these things. That's encouraging. In brief, my faith has been severely tested and damaged in the past year, but your ministry has helped a great deal in answering questions. Oh, praise God. Yep. That's Dispelling great. doubt reigniting my layman's interest in science and securing my belief that the Bible is the first and foremost resource of all. Thanks again um, from this person. I mean, oh, isn't that great? It, it, it is. That's just, that is wonderful to, to, to get feedback like that. Yep. 
um, is it, just that's that's what it's all about. Exactly. We're strengthening people's faith. This, this fellow here said he's he had, it, it, it's renewed his interest in science. I mean, right. th that's great too. That's, that's yeah. not one of our goals, but to strengthen people's faith in the Bible to show them that the accuracy of of what we look at in the biblical text is supported by, or what the biblical text says is accurate, it's supported by That's right. scientific evidence. I mean, what we did today was show that the Bible can be trusted on testable matters, like Noah's Ark, right? And, and, and so many Christian believers um, know that, well, if, if you can trust the Bible in, in those testable matters, then you can, you can trust them in all sorts of different matters, right? This fellow can go to his scripture and trust God's word, trust his promises that are in there. Yes. Um, basically, yes. that's what he's saying. I mean, John 3, 12. Um, Jesus is talking to Nicodemus about being born again, a, a specific context. But he says the words, if I've to, uh, told you about earthly things and you don't believe, how will you believe about heavenly things? Now that's right. in a specific context, but it does get you thinking. Is the Bible just about heavenly things, just about morals and, and you know, salvation and stuff like that? No. The Bible can be trusted on things like geography, you know, biology, history, science. So the things that we can empirically test, we show that, yes, they can be trusted, and then that uh, gives people people hope that they can right. trust the entire Bible. From and the things like Noah's Ark, the dimensions are there in the Bible. So right. That's not, that's, not a, that's not a heavenly thing. It's talking about the dimensions oh, of right. a large Why boat. was it in there? Uh, and, yeah. and yet, when, when engineers build structures using those dimensions, they're extremely stable, yeah. as, as we've shown in the last hour. Uh, just wonderful. One more point I'd make, too. You know, seeing that the, the Bible can be trusted on testable matters, um, non-believers that disregard its warnings uh, concerning future judgment and, and, and the moral issues and, and the things of, uh, talking about salvation, they do so at their own peril. Um, that's not to be, to be mean or anything to anybody who is not a Christian that's watching, but it's to really give you a heads up that you should really look into what the Scripture is saying. That's right. It's a good time to be a Christian. There's so much that supports what Christians believe and what the Bible says. That's right. We've got another feedback here. Noah's Ark never happened. This is the title. Is the way we've titled this. Um, uh, this letter from a fellow in England. His letter is printed first in its entirety, and then once more, uh, the complete lack of substance of anti-creationist attacks is glaring. His letter is printed again with point-by-point -point responses by Dr. Jonathan Sarfati of Creation Ministries International Australia. And so Dr. Sarfati is responding to this. Here's first an excerpt from this this fellow. Uh, what he wrote in. You know, in the civilized times we live in, I find it quite unbelievable that there are still people around who doubt the theory of evolution. I believe that everyone should have the right to make up their own minds, but the arguments in CMI are ridiculous in the extreme. <laughs> Dinosaurs could not have existed because they wouldn't fit, uh, they wouldn't all fit in Noah's Ark. Please, the story of Noah's Ark never happened. It's a parable, a story designed to represent a, deep, a deeper meaning. Do you truly, truly believe that dinosaurs are only 6,000 years old? There's so much overwhelming evidence to the contrary. And he goes on, there's other, other accusations he makes. So here, here's the refutation then from Dr. Sarfati. I find it quite unbelievable that there are still people around who assert that the theory of evolution is proven fact in spite of the mountains of evidence against it. Right. And that's what our magazine does and, and what we're trying to, uh, again, communicate on this show. Yeah. Uh, another response here. Do you truly believe that dinosaurs are only 6,000 years old? And, and the response is, of course. How else could red blood cells and hemoglobin survive in dinosaur bones? See example, and, and it's a link here, sensational dinosaur blood report, and another link, still soft and stretchy. <laughs> and about the latter, uh, uh, the find of flexible blood vessels inside dinosaur bone. Right. Uh, I must also point out that if we are to believe that dinosaurs are a certain age, then logically we must believe that they existed. So uh, just, and, and it goes on from there. There's other things we could talk about. Right. The evidences for the Bible are exciting for us as Christians today. There's so much out there that supports Christianity. It's an exciting time to be a Christian. That's right.